Debt is a lot more common than most people realize. 20% of American households spend more than they make. It is also possible to break free of debt. No matter where you are, there are some habits you can develop to help you live debt-free. Pay down your existing debt as fast as possible. Pay with cash when you can. Stash cash for emergencies. Ask yourself if you really need to purchase something and take some new tactics to earn more if you can. Learn more about living debt-free at stcumoney.org. Spokane listens when business talks. Welcome to Business Talks, the region's only local business talk show with your host, Ryan McNeese. Business Talks is brought to you by our friends at STCU and Well-Dressed Walrus. Now, let's get down to business with Business Talks. Welcome to Business Talks. I'm Ryan McNeese, and we're here in the studio with both Troy Bruner and Philip Egger. And they are the authors of Modern Machiavelli, 13 Laws of Power, Persuasion, and Integrity. Thank you guys for being here. This this is extremely interesting to me because at the core of, of business or any type of organization, I believe, is the psychology uh, behind that decision making. And if you guys could right off the bat uh, discuss how you came to uh, creating the story and, and why you felt there was a need for this. Sure. Um, well, in our consulting and psychotherapy work, we noticed a very strange pattern that a lot of the most talented, gifted, and successful individuals um, felt very dissatisfied in their careers mm-hmm. and personal relationships. We found that a lot of them really struggled with difficult personalities individuals who had some type of, um, from their point of view, selfish or overly aggressive Mm -hmm. um, uh, behavior or presentation that they experienced that really frustrated them. And we didn't quite know what to do about that because many of our clients did what we asked of them. So we would encourage um, direct communication and rational dialogue. Um, compromising they would usually do what we said or most of it they'd manage their emotions and question their um, uh, make sure that they had rational thoughts and and that they disputed any irrational thoughts but still they could not be successful with some aspects of interpersonal interactions with difficult people and they didn't know what to do and depend I'm sure that came up in most all industries it it probably wasn't specific to this industry or that but rather some of those personality dynamics were probably prevalent in most all industries of the folks you were working with absolutely it was very um, pervasive some of these experiences Mm -hmm. so we began taking notes and, and making observations about new strategies new ideas and also noticing some thinking errors that were very um common to what we would call good people, that is, people who just want to make a living and be successful and not hurt other people. One of them we found that was really key was expectations for reciprocity. Hmm. So that most people um, who are successful, not all of them, they go through life uh, expecting reciprocity. If they work hard, they're going to be rewarded. Mm -hmm. If they respect others, they're going to be respected. If they are trustworthy, mm-hmm. then people um, will develop good relationships with them. Um, but they had extreme difficulty when those expectations were disappointed. So they would keep mm-hmm. trying these reciprocity strategies like compromising and negotiating and trying to work things out with direct communication, but they were not successful because some personalities are extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. Or someone, maybe a competitor or a coworker, had a hidden agenda that they would not disclose that would perpetually interfere with the relationship. Absolutely. I, I see that quite a bit in the legal industry, that you're thinking if you're mirroring some of that hopefully positive behavior, that some of that behavior will be returned. And oftentimes it's not. And it is kind of a disconcerting psychology. How did, how did your from Oregon originally, I believe, and, and you're from Pennsylvania. How did your partnership in, in the sense of co-authoring this book come to fruition? 
We've been here for, uh, my family has been here for 26 years, so I feel like a native, okay. and, and we're, we're full now, okay? okay. So, <laughs> they, you know, whatever we can do to just create uh, the uh, idea that we are now full. No, actually, yeah, yeah. we're welcome. Spokane yeah. is at a great point. Business radio is at a great point right now because what's happening in Spokane is phenomenal, mm -hmm. actually. Um, our son is in Seattle, and Seattle is full, okay? Absolutely. He's over there just recently. And what I noticed was how completely congested it is. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going to happen here, it is already happening. You're going to come here. Is we, our real estate is at the highest it's been in ever mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because Seattle is full. And it's a great quality of life, four seasons here. But how Troy and I got started on this, I met Troy about, um, I'm going to say about six years ago. And uh, he was working at a local um, large behavioral health uh, organization was interviewed by him and he was kind enough when I didn't get the job and he was on a board mm -hmm. at another organization. He said, well, we, we wanted to hire you, but some things happened and we weren't able to. Well, that was it started a great relationship. Um, we're very good friends now and colleagues. And what's interesting, Dr. Bruner is a psychologist. Right. I am trained to be a counselor, so I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Okay. And I work for a large multinational corporation and provide, provide behavioral health okay so when we started talking about these issues about integrity about the importance of what happens to good people when bad things happen to them and mm -hmm. they, they're doing everything right but somebody comes around who's maybe on the borderline side of being narcissistic mm -hmm. and manipulative those negative traits oftentimes take advantage of good people and mm -hmm. we were in agreement that we've got to do something about this and now dr bruner is going to be uh, a probably a very humble about the amount of work he did. I, he's always saying, well, I was a good compliment, which I, I think I was, because yeah. I had a lot of good people stories. Yeah. Good collaboration. But he really had the theories. He had the theories down pat, and I thought, well, this is a good team. The other interesting thing that Dr. Bruner said, being from uh, Portland, is that I was raised in the East Coast. So I kind of have an East Coast background. Mm -hmm. I was uh, gone to some of the, I guess, best schools, the biggest schools. Uh, Patriot League for you smaller NCAA fans, or Bucknell <laughs> University Absolutely. for undergrad, yep. and then Penn State University, larger, Absolutely. Uh, more well-known school. So um, I think that collaboration of a West Coast perspective and, a, and somebody from the East Coast mm -hmm. um, is a good collaboration, counselor and psychologist. So we really teamed together to come up with some ideas that would really help um, people thrive. One of the things, one of the reviewers on the book said this, and I love this saying. He said, and to be in the same conversation with a Stephen Covey, if people mm -hmm. know his self-help books, mm -hmm. he says, this is a Stephen Covey level book where the dolphins can learn how to swim with the sharks. I read that and I was hum I was like, wow, that is an awesome compliment. That is an awesome, and it, it actually says a lot, and I think it's worth noting, and we chatted about this briefly before uh, this segment that uh, some of our listeners might be familiar with the book by Robert Greene, 48 Laws of Power. Uh, but I think as you uh, so perfectly pointed out, the difference between that book and what I think you've attempted to accomplish is 48 Laws of Power is more from an amoral standpoint, where this is written from an integrity standpoint. Tell us a little bit more about that distinction. Sure. So the book, The 48 Laws of Power, was very inspirational. Mm -hmm. um, I've read it at least three times. Yeah, it's fantastic. Book. And what I like about it is it really does take a psychological angle about various principles mm -hmm. that we can use to survive and be successful in extremely difficult environments. And like our book, it's about persuasion and conflict management as well. But the huge difference getting to your question is that we include the element of integrity. Mm -hmm. In our work with clients, here's one thing we noticed. If we brought up a tactic that might be successful but was not moral in the clients from the client's point of view, then that person was either not going to do it very well or would not do it at all. Right. So what we had to do was take someone up to that line where they can be successful and worldly wise and engage conflict in difficult people, but at the same time, keep their core values intact and remain authentic to themselves mm -hmm. and their own values. And ultimately respect themselves for making those decisions. Absolutely. But 
in the process of doing that, we found that we needed to help people clarify their own values because good people have a lot of moral hangups mm. because they're conscientious. Mm -hmm. They're always thinking, did I do the right thing? Am I valuing money or status too much? Um, and so we had to really delve into that and identify some, some thinking errors, some ethical thinking errors that were basically moral hangups that good people are prone to so that they could get past them and be more successful. Okay. So walk us through some of what you would deem to be real key principles in the book, whether it be per a chapter or per some specific uh, uh, ideas in the book. Walk us through some of those that you, you feel really stand out uh, in the business world and or otherwise. Well, I, I think that the core idea to chapter one, and this underlies the entirety of the book, is that self-interest is the key to understanding human behavior. Now, it sounds so simple, mm -hmm. but a lot of people who live by reciprocity or even altruism uh, have some problems with that. But think about it this way. Everyone has self-interests, you, me, mm -hmm. and there's absolutely nothing wrong with pursuing our own self-interests. That is very different than selfishness. Uh, I have some coffee here, and it's in my self-interest to have coffee. If I stole your coffee, right. that would be selfish. But people often get those two things confused. They think mm -hmm. if they're looking out for their own needs, then maybe that makes them a selfish person. Mm -hmm. So that introduces self-doubt and uh, really slows them down and makes them question themselves. So that undermines confidence and strategy. What we wanted people to understand is that there's nothing wrong with acting in your own self-interest as long as you're not violating the rights of others and that it, just as critically, in order mm -hmm. to be successful socially and politically and in the business world, we must appeal to the self-interest of other people. Appealing to other things will not be as effective. Well, and, and I think you're right that where you have that, as you deem selfishness, it would be when it's at the exclusion of somebody else's possible advancement or uh, possible self-interest as well. Uh, Tell, it, tell us how, give us a couple examples of how that relates in the business world. And we, we might even have to take a short little break here because that's probably a longer question for you. Uh, but let's just jump into that a little bit. Uh, what, what, what are some client interactions where a, a business example would play that out? Sure. We found that with some of our clients who were professionals of, of this or that sort, that they would try interpersonal tactics that might work with them, right? but that did not work with others. Mm -hmm. For example, appealing to someone's sense of fairness or their values or uh, for their kindness. Hey, would you please do this favor for me? Or can you help me out? Those approaches do work with some people, but they're not as universally effective as appealing to some as appealing to right. someone's self-interest. Well, I think that's a great example. Let's take a short break and come right back and chat a little bit more about modern Machiavelli. Thank you both for being here. We'll come right back. You're listening to SpokaneTalksOnline.com, Spokane and North Idaho's business and community talk station. Debt is a lot more common than most people realize. 20% of American households spend more than they make. It is also possible to break free of debt. No matter where you are, there are some habits you can develop to help you live debt-free. Pay down your existing debt as fast as possible. Pay with cash when you can. Stash cash for emergencies. Ask yourself if you really need to purchase something and take some new tactics to earn more if you can. Learn more about living debt-free at stcumoney.org. Here's Rob Curley, editor of the Spokesman Review. Living life is complicated. They should give you an instruction manual, but they don't. So every day I feel like I have to try to put together an instruction manual for how you would live in, in, in eastern Washington. Sometimes that's big national news, sometimes it's local news, but sometimes it's just telling you where to get a good hamburger and why the Zag Zone really works this year. Online, in print, the Spokesman Review. Subscribe to the experience. Hi, this is Kurt Stockwell with Well-Dressed Walrus. We are a local website design and development company here in Spokane. 
What we do is build beautiful, usable websites for local businesses. The website needs to be beautiful. It needs to be usable for your users, your customers, and yourself. Contact us anytime. We'd love to talk with you about your online marketing. Welcome back to Business Talks. I'm Ryan McNeese, and we left for a short break, but we're back here in the studio with Troy Bruner and Phil Ager of Modern Machiavelli, 13 Laws of Power, Persuasion, and Integrity. And right before the break, we started to get into what we thought or what you thought were the fundamental elements uh, of the modern Machiavelli, if you will. And there are 13 different laws that are outlined in this book. Let's kind of start at the top and go through those 13 laws. We'll kind of touch on some maybe important facets of each of those. Let's start at the top, though. Okay. Well, the first law is expect others to act from self-interest. And this is a theme that underlies the entirety of the book, Mm -hmm. that people are primarily motivated by their own self-interest. Now, as I mentioned before, that is different from selfishness. Exactly. Right. Selfishness means other people get excluded or their rights get violated. Mm -hmm. But most people really are consumed by their own wants and desires. Uh, It's not safe for someone to imagine that um, their needs matter as much to others as they do to uh, Mm themselves. So we have to be realistic about our expectations in order to succeed in our efforts, efforts and protect ourselves from harm. Well, and, and jumping, looking right at uh, uh, principle number two, you cannot win over the unwinnable. I find that fascinating because that probably is extremely difficult for folks, as you indicated, that that reciprocity. What do you mean they're not winnable? Everybody has a little sense of, oh, I'm sure, you know, kill them with kindness, so to speak. Speak to that uh, principle a bit. Well, it's actually a myth that you can win everybody over. So There's, true. Some individuals have extremely difficult personalities and chapter two is unique in the book in the sense that it's the only chapter that focuses upon what we might call toxic personalities Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, or individuals with severe personality pathology some of whom are actually very successful they're successful because in our society results matter so if you think of the um less than honest salesman who has great numbers, he mm-hmm. might be promoted and rewarded over the honest salesman with less, uh, with lower numbers, mm-hmm. as long as not too many problems rise to the top. Right. So to deal with difficult personalities, mm-hmm. one mistake that people make is they think, well, I need to increase my niceness to win them over, mm-hmm. or some version of that. But persistent niceness is actually considered a weakness and can make you more of a target with some difficult personalities. Mm-hmm. We're talking narcissistic personalities, passive aggressive personalities, and other difficult personalities. Which, which is a pretty good segue to, I think, your third uh, fundamental principle, that actions are much more compelling than logic. And I see this in the legal world quite a bit, that if you argue logic, 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 ultimately I had an attorney elder attorney on the other side with a lot of wisdom say, but if I don't like your logic, I'm not going to go your way. I mean, so I think there's a lot to be said. Do you want to speak to that one a little bit? Certainly. And there's, and there's countless stories that speak exactly to the idea that actions speak and are much more compelling than logic. Mm -hmm. One that I can think of is this. For years, I worked in numerous school settings, large, small, triple A, double A, single A, B, Hmm. all sizes. And what I noticed over a period of time of having the privilege of working with both superintendents and principals in schools all over was that the schools that ran the most smoothly were those where the principals and the leaders took the actions that backed their words. Mm -hmm. So if I say the values of our school are integrity, kindness, friendliness, no bullying, treating others with respect, but I then am taking kids into the room and saying they're going to get paddled if they do the wrong thing, Mm -hmm. I'm not living my action. My actions aren't backing what I'm saying I want for my school. Mm -hmm. What I noticed was the schools that ran the smoothest and the best had the best leaders that did a thing I call servant leadership. Mm -hmm. They literally 
were there to serve and help their teachers be happy. They also modeled this throughout the school setting through their actions. What they did oftentimes was they would high five the children that were doing the exact positive behaviors that they wanted to be demonstrated in their school. Right. And it worked like magic. Well, you're it positively was just exacerbating right. that, that positive. Uh, again, it's uh, actions speak louder than words, I guess, is the concept we hear. Uh, in Number four is endure a minor wrong if it allows a much greater good. What do we have there? Well, basically, when you endure a minor wrong, an example would be this. Okay, so we all get into conflict. And that's one of the things that I like about Dr. Bruner's work is he's mm-hmm. constantly aware of if we're going to have conflict. Conflict creates good things, mm-hmm. okay? Don't avoid conflict. Don't be overly nice and appeasing because if you just do that, people are going to run over you, okay? Exactly. So what we I gotta have to do is take advantage of this conflict and use our, our ability to be strategic in when someone does something that is a minor wrong against us, we can either say, oh, I'm never going to do business with mm-hmm. them again. I, I just will not buy a car from, from Becker Buick anyway. because, right, right. you know, Becker Buick gave me a bad car. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to the owner and say, you know what, I got a bad car here, but, you know, could you work with me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The good leader, business leader, is going to say, how can I take care of my customer and make this work? Almost create a silver and line, it, if you it, will. right? Silver line. It could be any. I'm not trying to pick on Becker Buick. It could be any car dealership. Car dealership is a multi-million-dollar industry, and the industry spend billions of dollars on advertising. Mm-hmm. Their number one expense should really be beyond advertising is taking care of that customer, right? Because we all know the old uh, adage in business: if you treat one customer poorly, they're going to tell 25, 300 of their friends how bad they were served at that business. Mm-hmm. That's why business leaders really have to take advantage of this and do a door minor wrong. You have a difficult customer? Okay, no mm-hmm. big deal. How can we work together to fuse this relationship so that we can move forward? Then good comes out of that negative conflict. I think that's a right. very important uh, principle. And number five is the majority are impressed with the superficial. I think that's one folks can very much relate to no matter the industry. Uh, is the the presentation of the individual and or organization and what that means, whether it's actually real, real or not. Let's speak to that. It's even more critical, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to recognize this in the era of social media because mm-hmm. when someone first meets us, whether it's at a job interview or in a networking capacity or even um, in a casual encounter, we can expect that they're going to Google our names mm-hmm and look at our social media profiles. So we have to assume that that's going to happen, that we are basically many brands, Mm -hmm. each of us. Now, a lot of people don't like it and they resist it. They think, well, superficial things are beneath my dignity. I want people to get to know the real me. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the real world, that shuts doors to opportunity. If you really want to be successful in interpersonal engagement, you have to play on what psychologists call the primacy effect. Mm. That is what people first see, hear, and experience is going to carry a lot of weight. Now that Mm -hmm. might not seem fair. It might not seem right because your social media profile or other things about you that are just casually observed may not be as important as your critical thinking skills, as your work ethic, as who you are as a person. But that is not going to be discovered unless someone gets to know you over Mm -hmm. time. So that door that opens first is going to be from the primacy effect. So we have to appeal mm -hmm. to the superficial. A bit like the Malcolm Gladwell blink concept, that what are people going to think at that blink concept? Uh, And if it's superficial, it's superficial, but it might be that first uh, presentation, that first impression. Number six is boldness and audacity produce success. Some of the most successful people are the biggest risk takers. Mm -hmm. So if you think about Steve Jobs, many of the big um, innovators and uh, tech company uh, success stories, uh, even going back to the railroads in the 1800s, what you'll see is that there were a lot of failures and there were a lot of successes, mm-hmm. but the biggest successes often were associated with the biggest risks. Right. A lot of 
smart people are cautious people, but they're too cautious, so they avoid taking risks, and that's unfortunate. But it's natural and normal to fear risks mm -hmm. because you don't know how things are going to turn out. So what Chapter 5 talks about are techniques and methods to make sure people can take calculated risks right. and to capitalize on opportunities. Well, and I think Seth Godin, you're probably familiar with Seth Godin, one of his concepts or phrases is safe is risky. My kids give me a back time because I say that all the time in the sense that it's a, it's a great balanced phrase that you can't be too risky, but if you're too safe, it's risky. And I think that's a good phrase as to what you're getting at to a certain extent. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but uh, let's get through a couple more of these. The chapter 7 is conflict is inevitable and selectively advantageous. I think that actually goes to what you were saying a little while ago, that, again, take that uh, concept of potentially get comfortable being uncomfortable and, and maybe create a silver lining from that. Chapter 8 is what is given away freely is seldom valued. I, I think that's an interesting business concept. What are, what are a couple thoughts on that? Well, again, I like to give stories to everything. So, but think of the uh, what is given away freely is seldom valued. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you're going to say the county fair. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to give out some free pens. We're going to give out some free flashlights. Okay, well, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, but are they going to really come back and do business with you because they got a free pen? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I don't know. But but really, people value, especially in the counseling field, which is, is a business, a um, multi-million dollar business, yeah. is if my client makes an appointment to come see me and I say, your service is free, you don't have to pay, my no-show rate skyrockets. Absolutely. There's, they, then there's less value, no perceived buy less right. value. But if they have to pay for that appointment, they're going to show up. Yeah. And then they're much more likely to work on the behavior change that I'm trying to advocate for them to hmm. do. Because I often, well, for every session, give people, this is the homework. I need you to do this. And then come back next week and let's see if you did the homework. And if yep, they didn't yep. do the homework, that means they weren't investing in themselves and they were not uh, basically doing what they needed to do because they thought everything was free and easy. Well, as you Change indicated, is that, hard. that buy-in, that engagement, I think is what you're really touching on. Right. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, forward on chapter 11, the majority prefer fantasy over harsh realities. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to run out of time, and so we're not going to be able to hit on that. But uh, another one, be conspicuous or risk getting overlooked. These concepts I think are crucial to the business world. And I think you got a really uh, important, exciting book here. And I really appreciate you both coming in. I'd, I'd like to see this book really get out there in the market and maybe have you come back in again and discuss more of the principles. Thank you guys so much for being here on Business Talks. Look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Excellent. Business Talks is produced in Spokane, Washington by SpokaneTalksOnline.com, which is solely responsible for its content. Ask a question, recommend a guest, and hear this program again online anytime at SpokaneTalksOnline.com. Business Talks is brought to you by our friends at STCU and Well-Dressed Walrus. Business Talks wishes you good business and a good day. Hi, this is Kurt Stockwell with Well-Dressed Walrus. We are a local website design and development company here in Spokane. What we do is build beautiful, usable websites for local businesses. A website needs to be beautiful. It needs to be usable for your users, your customers, and yourself. Contact us anytime. We'd love to talk with you about your online marketing. What is a credit union? It's a cooperative, like a food co-op or a housing co-op but the members share money. Credit unions offer the same services you'll find in a bank, but they're different from banks. First, credit unions are owned by their members, and credit unions are not for profit. Any money the credit union makes goes right back to the members in the form of low fees and good rates. To learn more, you can go to STCU's blog at stcumoney.org.